fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And now we have a, a, a great guest now, um, kind of along the same lines. I know that uh, he's had quite the career with the uh, NSA and, and with Disney, and uh, um, he has a couple of uh, books that really are interesting. The Brain Safari, Five-Minute Experiments to Explore the Space Between Your Ears. Uh, that was really what caught me. And, of course, he's been writing for um, it, it, quite a few publications. Let's get, let's get him on. Dr. Eric Hazelton, how are you doing today? Doing great. How about you? You know, not too bad. Surviving. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to say it. Um, so uh, you, you have quite the history. So you were right into uh, government security, NSA, and all that, and then you switched over to Disney. Um, that must have been quite a change. Actually, it was the other way around. I was an executive at Disney when the NSA director saw me on TV, and uh, I was recruited to run R&D at NSA. So I left uh, Disney to work at NSA. And then I was promoted a few years later to be the CTO of the intelligence community of the United States. Wow. And um, so how does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't as much of a shift as you'd think, because when you're in the R&D business and doing innovation and working on the frontiers, the bleeding edge of science, the issues are really the same. It's really not about the technology. It's about getting people to change their behavior. Because when you're introducing some new innovation, that's always the hardest part. Yep. And so it's kind of people engineering, not engineering engineering, which is common to both intelligence and media. Right, right. Just a different person uh, you're working for. Um, now, I noticed you've been writing a lot about uh, things about our brain. And uh, mm -hmm. in a way, how to improve or how to realize what our brain is doing to us. Uh, what do you think mm -hmm. the biggest shock or surprise to people is about what our brain does that we don't realize? That we have an illusion of being in control of ourselves when we're not. Really, our brain is, and the part of us that's conscious is a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of a percent of what's really going on. For example, when you and I are talking right now, you don't know exactly which words are going to come out of your mouth until you hear them. Someone else deep inside your brain is forming those words. Who is that someone? And most of the behaviors you do every day, just driving to work, you don't tell your left hand, turn three degrees to the left. It just happens. And so because in life things happen so fast, our brain has automated almost everything. And we're really more observers than controllers of our behavior. So who is controlling our behavior? And please don't say it's the NSA or Disney. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because it could be Disney for me. I have an annual pass, so they, they might have yeah. some control. Oh, well, that's good. Brain. Well, God bless you for that. Um, <laughs> well, um, that's a, that is actually the question that has consumed most of my life as a neuroscientist, is diving deep into the unconscious. And the short answer is there isn't a single other you although in my book, Brain Safari, I talk about the other you. Um, and I give an example in the opening of the book where I grew up out in China Lake, three hours north of here in the Mojave Desert, and I rode horses. And when I was young, they put me on a quarter horse that got away from me. And I was completely a passenger. The horse was just going to do whatever it is. And our brains are like that horse. You know, you're riding your brain like you're riding a horse, and you have the illusion that you're telling at where to go, but in fact, your brain decides where it wants to go and gives you the illusion that you told it what to do, when in fact, it's the opposite. 
And you can kind of prove that to yourself right now. If you just uh, force yourself to have a big, wide grin, like the biggest smile you can, you'll actually feel a little happier. If you frown and scowl as hard as you can, you're going to feel sad and maybe angry. And the way emotions work is that you don't cry because you're sad. You're sad because you're crying. You're happy because you're laughing. So your emotional brain controls your body and tells it what to do. Then your conscious brain observes that and decides what it's feeling. So that's a big shock, that everything is exactly backwards from the way we thought it is. See, that's really fascinating. And I, I, I think there's a lot of different work that sort of dovetails into that. Like, you know, political scientists, you know, for the last 70 years have been showing that, uh, you know, people don't really look at evidence and then come to a conclusion. It's they have the conclusion, then they find the evidence that sort of uh, buttresses it. It's a, a lot of this is motivated reasoning for people. You know, evidence doesn't change minds. People have their minds made up, and there isn't that much conscience that you can do about about an opinion. Well, that's right. Um, our desires shape our perceptions. And there's a whole, uh, Denny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize, and he wrote the book, thinking fast and slow. He talks about cognitive biases that we all have. These are blind spots in our brains that we're not aware of in the way we perceive and make decisions. And uh, one of them is what you said. We, don't, we tend to perceive what we want to see and don't see what we don't want, and we see what we expect and we don't see what we don't expect. Yeah, I was uh, watching the, uh, the, the coverage of the Trump speech so afterwards there was a poll done and they asked people nationwide um did did trump's speech change your mind and like 90 percent of people said no but (laughs) but 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 the critique of that is that people don't know what changes their mind right i mean minds change but people don't always know why well i think there's a problem with terminology i would never say mind is the right operative word i would say heart or Mm. gut or emotion People behave based on emotion, not on logic. And one reason is, there's, in uh, cognitive neuroscience, there's this term called affective primacy. Affective means emotion. And our emotions happen a lot faster than our thoughts. And our emotions directly control our behavior. The, quote, emotional part of your brain, although this is an oversimplification, is called the limbic system. You probably heard about the amygdala and... Mm-hmm you know, hypothalamus and other parts of the so-called emotional or lizard brain or whatever you want to call it, it has direct control of our body. And when you see a threat, you have an emotion, either fear or anger, and it causes your body to either attack or run. And it has to be instant or you die. And because our ancestors were quick, we're here to talk about it. Um, And so uh, our emotions happen much faster than our thoughts and our reasoning. And they dictate our behavior. They literally control our bodies. And so our conscious mind is really just an observer and a passenger that is conveniently given the illusion. Uh, It reminds me of a great cartoon I once saw in The New Yorker about these two baby twins in car seats in the back seat that each have steering wheels. And one twin turns to the other and says, you know, I turn the wheel and the car moves, but I don't see them as being correlated. And that's, that's kind of what we are. We're those little babies in the car seat with a steering wheel, and we think that we're turning the car, and in reality, the car is turning itself and allowing us the illusion that we're driving it. Mm. So, so I, I guess the question I have then is, you know, as, you know, given the Internet and, and social media and all the things that have been going on lately with it, I mean, one of the problems these big tech companies are trying to solve is, you know, how can we stop bad information and how people react to it? And they're looking at these things from like a network point of view. Like, what can we do with the technology? But a lot of this really has to do with how humans interact with the information that they receive. And it's not, I think there's always this assumption that people see something and react in the way that, you know, would sound intuitive. But it isn't. It's, it's the, the, the processes are a lot more complicated than that well i think you have to go back to basic survival needs that are wired into our brains we as humans can't stand uncertainty 
because uncertainty means bad things could happen in the future and we could die. It's one of the reasons our brains seek novelty, and we actually get pleasure from being surprised, because our brain will do anything it can to reduce uncertainty. And if you already know the truth about politics or any other belief that you have, then you're not uncertain. And uh, so I think a lot of this, in terms of perceiving what we want to perceive instead of what's factual, is all about reducing uncertainty. You know, I, when I grew up out in the Mojave Desert, we had a prayer that said, that God help me to find the truth and avoid those who have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we all want the truth. We all want to believe that, you know, this is the way it is and this is the way it's going to be. Uh, there's too much anxiety that gets in the way of day-to-day -day life if things aren't certain. Yeah, and, and I, I think you see this in today's politics because you have these groups, you know, tribe, tribalism and, and people sort of, part, you know, cordon themselves off into their own little groups. And then when somebody in the group says something that's discordant, people can't really understand that. Why is that person's, you know, opinion a little bit different? Why are they breaking from the orthodoxy? They must be you know, some, yeah. a charlatan or, or a faker, and they have to be tossed out. Well, and that's why we have these echo chambers on the left mm. and the right. They both serve the same function. They reinforce worldviews and reduce uncertainty and make people feel comfortable about they understand the world. I mean, that's one of the things about humans that are unique is uh, we don't really know what goes on in other organisms, but... Probably it doesn't happen that others look up at the sky and wonder, well, where did those stars come from? What's that moon about? How are they related to what's going on here on Earth? We, we as humans are somewhat unique in that, in that we need to know why. We don't just need to know what. We need to know why. Where did we come from? Why are we here? What's going to happen in the future? We have these big frontal lobes, and the frontal cortex of the brain, which is the most recently evolved, spends most of its time in the future planning what's going to happen in the future. And it's a great gift, but it's also a great curse because it creates anxiety. So that's, that's very fascinating. And, and I think there are so many things that sort, of, that, that sort of applies to and particularly applies now. But I guess, you know, how can we get around that? I mean, we have this, you know, these things that are in our brain that come from our, our, our evolution, and some of these things serve a purpose, but now, you know, maybe um, they don't serve as much a purpose as they used to. Like, I think of, like, Michael Shermer when he talks about conspiracy theories, and he says, you know, if you were walking through the... Um, you, you know, through the jungle and you hear rustle in the brush, it's better to assume that it's a tiger coming to eat you than not, because yeah. if, you, if you're if you wrong, then you get eaten. Um, well, that's right. That's precisely why negative publicity in politics works, because the path of ignoring negative information is far more catastrophic than losing the benefit of ignoring yeah. positive information. But how can, so we I guess are the biased question is how, toward the negative. How can we move beyond that? Is there a way that we can train... Yeah young people yeah. to sort of think beyond this evolutionary patterns that we have? Yes. Um, in my checkered past, I was a psychotherapist. I uh, did work at a free clinic in the South Bay of uh, Los Angeles area. And I had a clinical supervisor as, as an intern who said to me, you can never let go of something you don't admit having in the first place. And mm -hmm. so the first step is to acknowledge that we have these biases. And that's the most important step, uh, awareness, that we really, you know, getting around the denial is kind of like the uh, first step in any 12-step program, is admitting that there is an issue. And one way to do this for your listeners is just Google cognitive biases. And there's a fascinating Wikipedia page on it that describes like 100 different uh, biases that, that we have, and when you read through that, you'll see, oh my God, I am like that. There's another test that I have on my uh, website on uh, drhasseltine.com under the Brain Safari Interactive, because there's an interactive component to go with the print book, and in there, I have a test to uncover your hidden biases. Uh, what the test does, it's called the Implicit Apperception Test, 
And what it does is it shows you, and I've taken this test myself and been shocked at the biases and prejudices that I have that I didn't know that I have. It's a very uncomfortable experience, believe me, when you realize that, you know, I thought I was very open to diversity and all these things, and politically I am, but deep down emotionally, you know, there's a part of my brain that isn't. And so I'm aware of that. It's kind of like... Uh, if you've ever shot a weapon and in the wind, there's windage that you put in that you compensate for. And so one thing is to know by analogy that there's windage, that we are not objective, and that there is compensation we need to do. That, uh, you know, if we're judging someone, we need to say, well, if this person falls into a particular category, we need to go overboard the other way because our automatic unconscious process is to is to judge them negatively. Yeah, I so, see this so much in politics, too. Mm -hmm. I see this so much in politics, too. Like, as soon as Trump won, once you did polling on things like how good is the economy or is the country going the right direction, I mean, everybody's views flip depending on their party relative to that of Trump. Yeah. So Republicans yeah. are saying, oh, everything is great now, even though nothing really changed. And Democrats said everything yeah. is terrible, even though nothing really changed. And right. then... You know, people who really hate Trump have all been watching MSNBC and are absolutely convinced that there is a terrible conspiracy going on. And then Republicans are like, no, everything is great. So really, and, and they don't really know the processes that are going on in their brains that sort of bring them to this. They don't know it's their no. dispositions that are driving it. They think it's just the information that they're getting, but they're choosing the information because of the underlying things going on in their brain. Well, uh, let me give you an analogy about why that works. We all have a literal blind spot in our vision where the optic nerve punches through the back of our retina on its journey to the brain. And at about arm's length, it's the size of a silver dollar, uh, and there are two of them. Most people go their whole lives without ever realizing there's a huge blind spot in their visual field. And the reason is the brain goes to great lengths to cover it up. So your brain thinks you can't handle the truth. So the very instrument that you would use to judge your own objectivity is itself not objective. So there's no way we can be objective about our own biases. It's impossible. We just have to accept it on faith. And that's tough. It's tough to, uh, you know, embrace our imperfections. Yeah, nobody wants to do that, and I, 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 I tell you, it's this whole thing with the Trump investigation, and this isn't to say that he isn't guilty of something, he very, mal, very well may be, um, but people are absolutely so convinced, and they've been in this sort of information blockout with Mueller, and that has allowed them to make up whatever sort of fantasy they want, so with every new headline, every day it's, they're going to get them in cuffs today, they're going to get them in cuffs today, and it's been a year and a half, and he hasn't been in cuffs yet. Yet every single headline is "We got him," um, and, and and the people in the in the Republican Party say, "Oh, this is all fake news." So it's it's yeah. really just the the disposition that people see what they want to see, they seek out what they want to see, which makes it even worse. So they're in a bubble to begin with, and then they can't really tell why they're interpreting everything the way they're interpreting it. That's true, and but I don't think this is new. Uh, you know, no, this goes no, it's back, definitely not new. <laughs> it's always been the case, and the really important thing to understand is that these perceptual and emotional mechanisms are there for very good reasons in evolution. That, um, for example, affiliation with the tribe and the clan to create cohesiveness, so that we uh, are more than the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in societies. These things have a great binding together, uh, and it, unfortunately, one way humans bind together is they align against another group, and this is hardwired into our genes. So I think that we shouldn't judge these things as being bad. You know, if, if we say to people, well, you have these bad qualities and you need to understand them and get rid of them, you know, how, how good is that going to work? But if you say to people, you know what, these things are there, they're valid, they're there for really good reasons, for survival of our ancestors, 
Um, and you're not bad because you have these. It's just that you have to acknowledge that they're there. So, yeah, I really like that. And, you know, one thing that I, I talk about to my class to try to get them to talk a little bit more is that, you know, people come to very different conclusions about the same thing. Like you have a lot of people who deny climate change and you have a lot of people who are absolutely certain that it's happening. But both groups tended to go through the same process to get to where they're at. They both trusted the information sources that their underlying psychology brought them to. Right, so Republicans trust Senator Inhofe when he says, "Look, I have a snowball that proves it's <laughs> there's no global warming," right. and Democrats listen to their leaders just because they're leaders. But no one sat down and read a climatology journal to you know to figure out what the real data says. They're just listening yeah. to to their own bubble. Yeah, well, you know, and people talk about us living in the post-truth universe. I would say that's kind of delusional, and that we've always been in the pre-truth universe, and probably always will be. You know, I don't see anything changing anytime soon. Uh, you know, human nature is not something that turns on a dime. Yeah, that's very true. I, th- you know, it's, I, I like that idea of pre-truth universe because we're constantly searching for better truths and we, we haven't got to them yet. Um, we've gotten some, but obviously not all of it. But it's yeah. it, the idea that somehow only in 2016 did we start believing wrong things sort of ignores all of human history and that we've believed wrong things forever. And uh, that even even before 2016, like there are people with lots of bad beliefs. Well, that's true. And uh, I want to turn briefly to the subject of intelligence analysis, uh, because one of the biggest dangers that intelligence analysts, and I was one for three years on Russian cyber. Uh, After I left the government, I did this as a contractor. And we're trained about our biases, that we have to be really, really careful not to see what we want to see. And one way they do it, which might be useful to people who truly want to guard against their bias, is a method they teach at the Sherman Kent School of Intelligence that's really run by CIA for analysts. These are not the case officers who go out in the field and recruit spies. These are the people who look at the take that comes back and assess what it means. And they're trained to use what's called the method of competing hypothesis, that when you see a phenomena, come up with alternative reasons for it. Uh, you mentioned conspiracies. Well, I was in the business where conspiracies were not, were, I mean, were real. I mean, in the intelligence and military world, people are out to get you. There's no doubt about it. And so when we see a phenomena, we always have to ask ourselves, for example, is this malice and intent on the adversary's part or just incompetence? Because sometimes they're indistinguishable. And most of the time when I've seen a phenomena in an adversary and wondered, was this some intentional scheme that was well thought out and plotted out, or did they just stumble into this, or did they just have an internal fight where they're fighting each other and we really don't know what's going on? Almost always incompetence was a better explanation than malice. Uh, and uh, I, I would not say that, by the way, about the Russian influence on our electoral process. I think that was definitely intentional. But a lot of things that you see uh, aren't conspiracies in the way you think of them at all. They're just kind of normal human nature. And uh, the point I'm trying to get to is that uh, I learned a lot as an intelligence analyst about really working double, triple hard to be aware of your biases and try to scrub them from what you're doing because you're not serving anybody if you inject your biases into intelligence estimates. I mean, there are a lot of studies that show that people who like to ascribe intentionality to things that they see are very likely to believe in conspiracy theories Mm -hmm. because nobody says, oh, well, things just... or conspiracy theorists just don't, don't say, oh, you know, things sometimes just happen. It, it always has to be somebody did it. It has to be a purposeful outcome. And and sometimes it sort of strings things together that don't belong together and say that person must have done it. I mean, like with your example of Russia, I mean, it's I, I mean, I'm convinced it's absolutely true that Russia tried to influence the election um, with this 
you know, the cyber warfare. I'm not convinced yet that, that Trump somehow was involved or directed it. It could be true, but I, I don't believe it yet. Um, but sometimes people go a step further and they say, well, it was the Russians who then controlled the outcome of the election and they made it happen. Now, that's going a much bigger step further in saying that that these messages they put onto Twitter or Facebook actually changed minds. And I'm not convinced that that's the case either because, you know, what we know about um, how people vote, I mean, oftentimes people's minds are made up decades in advance um, before the candidates are even announced. Um, so I'm not sure how much of an effect that, that, that these Facebook or Twitter messages had on people's yeah. voting. I don't think it's knowable, but I want to come back to the Russia thing. I'm focused on Russia. I'm something of a Russia expert, and I have a new book coming out in which I talk about how the Russians discovered that if they make a major penetration of us, really aggressive, I mean really audacious and aggressive, that what happens is that we deny it, we finger point, we infight, and we do a lot of internal damage. In addition to the great intelligence that they gather, they splinter and divide us. And my book tells the story of how this happened 40 years ago with the uh, KGB penetration of the Moscow station, our CIA station in Moscow. And the point is that we have taught the Russians that when they lean way forward and be hyper-aggressive, the worst that happens is good. They get great intelligence and they splinter us. And that's exactly what you saw. And that, I don't know whether that was an intentional uh, goal, but I suspect that it was. Because if you go all the way back to Lenin, he says that we are a weak economy. We're, you know, he didn't use those terms, but we're a third world country. We have to exploit every advantage. And the way we're going to win is we're going to divide our enemy against themselves. So this has been Russian tradecraft forever. And, uh, you know, it's working. But let me ask you a question. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, that sort of seems like like every everybody who wants to compete with other countries. You know, one of the all, uh, goals that they always have is we'll divide them against themselves and conquer. I mean, I, I can watch any Saturday morning cartoon and the villain will say that. So it doesn't sound like that. I mean, it sounds sort of banal more than anything else. I mean, I understand why somebody would want to do it. But what do they gain? Assuming that's what they want, what do they gain from saying, oh, they're going to be polarized politically? Like, what do they get out of that? Well, Russia has what they call strategic tasks. Uh, one of them is to maintain influence in the near abroad, which is their former republics and the mm -hmm. former Warsaw Pact. And they, the number one problem they have is NATO. NATO is the biggest counterweight against the Russians maintaining influence in the near abroad. And uh, so they want to divide NATO against itself. That's their number okay. one strategic goal. It's, it's, it's political military. But the other thing you have to understand about Russia is, you know, we think of our government as being a government. There, the distinction between organized crime and the government is not so much. So some of their motivations are financial. So, okay, but again, I mean, how does that translate into... Like, you know, the idea that we're polarized and our politicians call each other names and, mm -hmm. you know, Democrats and Republicans are angry at each other. Like, how does that help them with organized crime or with trade or, or with anything like that? Because if we're because I could see if we were united and united saying we really love Russia, then Russia would benefit from that. So so I, I, I guess to me, it would seem like it depends on what we're divided about and how that how that would lead to action that would either benefit or hurt them. Well, we represent constraints on their behavior. Okay. And to the degree that we are splintered and divided against ourselves, we're not a very good constraint. And we allow them to do all sorts of things, like uh, go to war with Ukraine, invade Georgia, annex the Crimea, uh, you know, exert strong political influence on the Baltic regions and uh, in Eastern Europe. All of these things that they're doing. Um, and, you know, why do countries act in their own self-interest to the detriment of others? Why is it a zero-sum game? It all comes back to what I said about what's wired into our genes. We, we unite with each other 
in large part by focusing against another group. You know, this, this isn't unique to Russia. They all do it, and we are what they call their uh, main enemy and have always been. And, um, you know, Russia is interesting. They have $1 for every 13 we and NATO have on military, and yet they've maintained them on a par with us. And the way they do it is that they focus their technology investments in very narrow areas that give them maximum advantage, intelligence being the primary, and they also are extremely good at splintering their adversaries. So, so where does this go from here? I mean, I, 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 I guess I could sort of see what happened in 2016, um, and I'm not sure what what Russia has necessarily gotten out of it because I'm I, I'm wondering if maybe the the atmosphere is actually worse for them now because of their meddling. I mean, it, it came out. I mean, they, they sort of announced themselves as someone who does this, so now it can be dealt with more by the tech companies. Um, I can't imagine that they would have thought they were going to put fake news out there and then not get caught. Um, well, it wasn't you know, hard to catch it, them. Yeah, In foreign policy and military affairs, there's this idea of deterrence. Mm-hmm. And one of the things the Russians have accomplished is a message to the world. We are badass, you mess with us, and this is what happens. You know, Hillary Clinton in 2011 reportedly exerted influence or tried to inside Russia, you know, to further the orange movement and the spread of democracy through Eastern Europe. Putin didn't like this, and one way of interpreting what he's done is saying, you mess with us, this is what happens to you. Mm-hmm. And this is the message, whether he intended it or not, that is the message that the world got. So it's not just what you accomplish in the near term, it's the threat of what will happen to you if you mess with us, in, you know, in the future. Okay, so so uh, that I get, and that makes perfect sense, but in some ways it's backfired on him, too, because... I mean, the Democrats for the last several years have not been anti-Russia. And you go back to 2012 right. when Mitt Romney was sort of like, Russia presents a serious threat. And Barack Obama retorted by saying, well, hey, the 1980s called. They want their foreign policy back. Right. Right. So, you know, so, so you had a Democratic Party that wasn't anti-Russia, but now they're very anti-Russia. And their line is, you know, Trump is some sort of Russian traitor and being controlled by the Kremlin and now we hate Russia and you have half the Republican Party who are um, you know definitely want to go into Syria to fight Russia um, mm-hmm. and it, it, uh, you know sometimes against Trump's what seem to be his tweets I don't know if there was wishes but there was tweets <laughs> so it seems like we're more anti-Russia now than they than we were before well you know that could be true I mean, in some way, we're united on that. <laughs> yeah, I, that is a fascinating thing, that the long-term consequences of a short-term success are unknown. It's like in that movie, Charlie Wilson's War, where they said, hey, we just you know, got the Russians out of Afghanistan. That's a great thing. And the other side said, well, we'll see, because al-Qaeda grew out of that, right? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I don't claim to know that you know, Putin is doing his country any big favors by his behavior. Um, but I do think that they also know that people have short memories. And, uh, you know, I remember in Watergate, after uh, Jimmy Carter won, people said, well, we're never going to have a Republican president again forever. Well, guess what? (laughs) Four years later, we had a Republican president. And the Russians know this. So they probably think, although I don't know this for a fact, they may be thinking, well, you know, hey, we're getting a lot of short-term benefit out of this. In the long term, they got short memories. They'll be on to the next Cardassian scandal or whatever. <laughs> you know, and it's probably true. I mean, if you look at Watergate, I mean, I, you, I don't know, you guys were around when it happened. I was there, and it was like, oh, my God, the biggest scandal ever. And, you know, four years later, we got a Republican president. Yeah, and people don't just don't remember, right? You know, they yeah. just, you see that with Hollywood, too. You have Mel Gibson up for best picture for producing, you know, 10 years ago, he was the worst racist in the world. Well, right, and this comes back to the brain, by the way. There, there is, um, and Kahneman was one of the guys who got the Nobel Prize for this, it turns out our brains make an inch of now worth a mile of later. In other words, yeah. we value something instantly much greater than later. So the classic experiment is you have a teenage kid, you say, I'll give you... Um, 
uh, $10 right now, or if you wait a day, I'll give you $11. And almost all the kids say, I want the $10 right now. And if you plot out that curve, it implies a discount rate of like 1,000% interest, right? <laughs> uh, and so, so our brains are not at all rational when it comes to these things. We, we bias the now. There's a term for it neuroscientists use called temporal myopia, where we see kind of a now and a little bit later, like tomorrow, and everything else, eh, well, let it take care of itself. Hmm. You know, you, you brought up a point earlier about um, it, it, almost like the brain filling in places where it, it doesn't have the information to give an answer. Mm-hmm. So, so, so in essence, we will hear and see things that we're not really hearing and seeing. That's absolutely true. Um, in fact, uh, getting back to expectation, uh, I have an app on the on my website where I demonstrate this, where I show a referee. Like, you guys watch football? Not too much anymore. Well, you know what happens at the beginning of a football game where they come out and they got a big coin and the referee, you know, tosses Flips it in the, the air. Coin. And yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. So after the coin toss, what happens in the game? Um, one side, one side kicks, the other no, side I, catches. I, I, I caught that. <laughs> he caught it. One, you see, that's most I people didn't. It. I didn't say coin toss. No, he said. I coin said coin toss. coin toss. Yeah. And you didn't expect me to say that, and it was approximately what you thought. So your brain filled it in. Ah. Your yeah. brain filled in what it expected to hear, not what was actually there. And oh. we do that all the time, and. Our brain, our brain purposely blinds us to our blind spots because it doesn't want us worrying about them and being distracted. It's just like Jack Nicholson said, your brain thinks you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and so it protects you from the truth. And the, the truth is that your brain, you know, we look at this brain and we hold it up on a pedestal as this amazing thing that is baffling and mysterious, and it is all of that. But the fact is it cheats and takes shortcuts and does all sorts of dastardly stuff that aren't all that sophisticated or accurate, but uh, it gets by because it blinds you to the fact it's doing that. Because what is it that's going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, call it out on what it's doing? It's it. And it's going to say, well, am I going to tell my owner that I suck? No, I'm not going to tell him that. I'm going to tell him I'm great. So I'm almost afraid to ask this question, but are you saying that when I look in a mirror, I'm not as beautiful as I think I am? <laughs> Because I think that's my well, biggest worry case, now. In your case, that's not true. You're probably oh, more good. beautiful than... <laughs> and, and you know, the thing is, you're not even saying that. My brain is just making it sound like you're saying that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, well then how do, how do we rely on the information that's gathered into our brain from perhaps seeing or hearing things that aren't really what happened? Well, you know, most of the time it isn't a problem. But uh, sometimes it can be a problem. Um, I give an example of this with sunglasses. Did you know that when you wear sunglasses, you slow the information of your eye to your brain significantly, slowing your reaction time? Now, your brain doesn't know this. Your brain covers it up and says, I'm about as fast doing reaction with and without sunglasses. But it's enough milliseconds slowing down that it could be fatal. Hmm. And I tell people, don't wear sunglasses when you're driving. Now, why is that? Uh, well, uh, because the intensity of a sensory stimulus determines the speed with which it conducts uh, down axons into the brain. The, the more intense, the quicker the stimulation builds up and the faster it propagates down axons. So, so, so if I'm looking at something that's brighter, it's going to go quicker to my, to yes, my brain. Okay. That's absolutely right. And you can prove this to yourself. Just get a friend and get a yardstick and hold out your arms straight ahead of you about six inches apart, have them put the bottom of the yardstick at the top of where your hands are and drop it and clap your hands as soon as you can when they drop it and count how many inches go through your hands and then repeat the experiment with sunglasses. And you will find more yardstick goes through your hands with the sunglasses. And if you calculate the acceleration rate of gravity you can and how many inches, you can plot exactly how many milliseconds that is. But in a, you know... How many times have you just barely stopped in time not to hit that car in front of you or the dog running out or the ball rolling in front or whatever? We've all had that experience. 
So everyone who's and, listening uh, to us in the car right now, take off your glasses. <laughs> right. But definitely because we air at uh, 8 o'clock at night, <laughs> you yeah. shouldn't have them on anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Not good. No. Yeah. Well, but, but my point, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, most of the time we get by. And uh, there's a great uh, uh, psychologist called Gerd Gergerinzer, and he talks about the brain's fast and frugal decision-making and how we do what's called satisficing, which is mean, uh, you know, satisfying the situation that most of the time is going to be the case. So it's really about uh, the probabilities that most likely you're going to encounter this situation and the most probable best reaction is this. Not 100% certain. So our brain does shortcuts and is fast and frugal. Is the fascinating thing about the brain is that it consumes 20 to 25 percent of all the calories that we burn. It's a huge energy source, if you will, or energy consumer. And so our ancestors, who were always subsistence living right on the verge of starvation, conserving energy and brain energy and thought processes was really important to survival. So, so doing things fast and doing them with low energy consumption is important. Um, and the problem we get into is that the rules that obtained 200 to 300,000 years ago when our brains finished evolving into their current form aren't the rules anymore. Like, for example, here's one. Eat as many calories as you can, as fast as you can, if you want to survive. That used to be really important. Now, it's how you get diabetes and you die young. So there are so many things that our brain, these rules of thumb that the brain has that made a tremendous amount of sense at one time that just don't make sense anymore. So so the smart people eat a lot and... <laughs> <laughs> well, the people that listen to their genes... No, no, why do we like sweet and fat? We like it because it's rich in calories. And we like rich in calories because calories, you know, back in the day, do you know that uh, 100,000 or so years ago, the average life expectancy was around 20 or 25? So how, what was the likelihood you were going to die of obesity or diabetes versus the likelihood you were going to die of starvation or malnutrition was going to weaken your immune system and you were going to die of an infection? So this, again, gets down to probability. It's the probability something's going to happen times the payoff. So back in the day when our brain evolved, uh, you know, the probability that you needed to worry about something more than a few days away was very low. The probability that you need to get food right now and survive and avoid that tiger over there and stay out of the rain was very high. So our brains are the way they are. They're kind of, it's, it's interesting, our brains are kind of like time machines that were zipped ahead 200, 300,000 years. And if you look at our brain's behavior today, it gives you a very good glimpse of what life was like 200,000 years ago. So now our brains are going to keep evolving, right? We're going to keep moving in a direction where we get out of the things that we do now? Now that is a fascinating question. And it, 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 evolution is dictated by what goes on in the environment and what goes on with sexual selection. Those are the two major forces. Um, and I believe, and I wrote an article about this for Psychology Today, is where are humans evolving next? I believe that the next version of humans is going to be what I call Homo CRISPR. CRISPR-Cas9 is gene editing. And we see in China where this has actually already been done with an infant brought to term. And I believe that humans are going to drive the direction of evolution of humans and that we're going to do it through gene editing. And you're going to see laws against it in the U.S., but other countries, eh, not so much. So I want blonde-haired, blue-eyed, six-foot, two, you know, athletic, healthy kids. That's what I'm going to get. And I can do that with uh, CRISPR-Cas9. So my own personal belief is that the environmental factors that have driven evolution up to this point, speciation owing to geographic isolation and strong selection pressures in an isolated environment, those things are going to be much less important. And what's going to dominate is 
us deciding the direction we are going to go. And it's not going to be one line. And it has never been, by the way, when you look at evolution, like hominid evolution, you always have radiations from different common ancestors into lots of different parallel lines. Like among the great apes, you have humans, bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, and so forth. Um, so you've seen a lot of that radiation. And the same is going to be true of humans moving forward. We're not going to evolve into just one thing. We're going to probably evolve into many different things and probably a lot more diverse than it was before because we're going to be able to control it. I mean, here's one way of thinking about it. When I was a kid, you went to the supermarket and you got Coke or Pepsi or 7-Up, right? And that was it. Now you go to a soft drink aisle in a supermarket and there's, you know, decaffeinated cola with Splenda. <laughs> there's a zillion different things. So in any area of human consumption, you have splintering going on. Same number with TV channels, you know, Internet. Splintering is just a fact of life. It's going to happen in evolution. You're going to have all these little splinter groups wanting to, you know, evolve into a particular different direction, and they're going to. And it's going to happen very fast because these CRISPR modifications go down into the germline so that we'll pass them on to our progeny. Wow. And I think it's inevitable. And uh, so we're going to have a paradigm shift in what drives evolution, that we are the most significant environment that will drive the direction of evolution. And I think it's going to happen astonishingly fast. Hmm. Like so. you may not recognize the human species in a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to have a lot of bathrooms then, one for each, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Why do we only have two sexes? We could have more than two. <laughs> exactly. I just, you know, yeah. just think go to the mall bathroom and there's... <laughs> exactly. I mean, I guess the question is if you could defi defi you know, design the perfect human, what, what would it be? I mean, why would we be stuck with two legs and two arms and two... We could have... Ten eyes to see everywhere and six arms to do more work and um, much longer legs to run faster and, and, and backs that, you know, don't give out on us as we, you know, become 40. Um, That's right. I guess the sky's the we'll limit, have, right? Uh, I read a science fiction story once about they did this with humans and spacefaring humans had no legs. They didn't need them because it was all weightless. They just needed really big arms to get around, mm. you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you're going to see that. Um I, for one, am not very enthusiastic about it. I, I think Michael Crichton, although he was he liked to pontificate and he was something of a didact, he was right, man. There's a lot we don't understand that we're messing with. And there are reasons that evolution does what it does, one of them being diversity. You know, evolution is an interesting thing. It changes before it has to change. If you look at, for example, immunity to plague, most of us who have a European background, our ancestors had a mutation on a surface protein that resisted infection from Yersinia pestis. Um, that was random. That happened before the bug came along. So evolution changes before it has to change, and so it will be ready for whatever comes. If we mess with that, and we People's start are just gonna designing die. what it's going to be, we're yeah. not going to be ready for what comes. Mm. And I think uh, it could be the end of us. Mm. Um, because I don't think we're as smart as uh, Mother Nature. Yeah, I think Mary Shelley's warning is pretty strong. I mean, when you do, you know, us trying to create the next monster, I mean, it's a monster. Yeah, yeah and it's going to happen. And it, it actually... You know, you heard about it, the Chinese doctor did it with an HIV-resistant infant. And you can see why that was a good thing. But the question is, that's the tip of the iceberg. If that's what became public, what isn't public? And yeah, I mean, do they have States, babies with gills or that, something like that? But in China, eh, I don't know. Yeah, it's like the end of Waterworld. It's been a great conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time for us. We'll have that linked up with our site as well. I'll link up all your information and books so people can just uh, go right to it if they're on our website listening. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. 
show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.